Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first accountability session of 2023. It's been a busy January, and there have been a number of significant events since our last meeting in December. Uh, today is, of course, the first opportunity for the board to discuss with you the implications of the resourcing announcement last week, which was stark, even though we all knew the budgetary pressures faced and that a reduction in headcount was coming. In spite of government commitments to securing 7,500 officers, we are now looking at 800 less officers and over 100 less police staff. As a board, we will, of course, continue to advocate for a better funding settlement for policing and the delivery of past government uh, commitments on officer numbers. But as I said last week, there is still a significant resource available to policing in Northern Ireland. So no doubt, Chief Constable, you will want to assure the public that you will be working to do your absolute best with what you have. And the board will play, a part, uh, play, pa play its part in that. A different policing model is needed going forward. The public need to know what to expect and we will support you and the team in whatever change and restructuring may now be required as a result of these financial pressures. And I think the question for us all is what the next three years will bring with a further 226 million budgetary shortfall to deal with. Uh, on, this month we have published two reports with recommendations. The annual human rights report looks at the compliance across a range of areas and is a good health check on how the service is meeting its legislative duties. We also published a specific report examining the use of force within policing, which did generate quite a bit of debate on the firearm recommendation, but we only have to look at events over the last week in the US to see why it is so important that police use of, use of force is regulated and that issues are discussed and debated for the future. We will, of course, be following up with you around the recommendations made in these reports. Chief Constable, the shocking stabbing of two police officers on the yes on the yesterday highlights the increase in numbers of assaults on officers and indeed other emergency services. It is an issue that the board looked at in the report on the human rights of police officer and staff published in December. I just want to put on record on behalf of the board that these attacks are completely unacceptable and are condemned by the board and must be condemned right across the community. We hope all officers involved make a speedy recovery and receive the appropriate occupational and welfare support. And aside from the actual impact on officers, some of whom have serious, suffered serious injuries. With a decreasing resource, resourcing situation, these incidents have implications as officers often need time to recover before becoming fit for full operational duties or require restricted duties. Chief Constable, we've had two brutal murders, but the death of Natalie McNally and her unborn child has shocked the community and brought into focus again the issue of violence against women. We wish to pass our condolences to her family and urge anyone with information that would help the police investigation to do so, either directly or anonymously. So we'll take some introductory remarks and then move to questions. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Chair. And uh, obviously we do appear before you today after a particularly busy operational period and with a lot of issues at stake given the financial outlook, which we described to you last week. But clearly it's our first chance to update the whole board in the effects of the budgetary situation we find ourselves in and look at the full year effect. For completeness, we talked about last week uh, the reduction by March of 309 police officers and 115 staff. But I think it's also important to stress that while that clearly is an operation concern, to take a cue from your point that, as we actually said last week, our commitment is we will still answer the phone we will still patrol and respond to emergency calls, we will still investigate crime, and we will still work across communities in Northern Ireland to keep people safe. Clearly, this is not a charter to terrorists, to those who want to conduct organised crime, abuse people in all sorts of different ways. So our commitment is that we will have to sort of reprioritise where detectives and other resources go to make sure that we don't lose momentum and some of the progress we've made. But inevitably, in some parts of the broad range of services that the public expect from us that less police will mean less policing and we'll obviously keep in touch with you as a board and indeed the public as we get clarity into next year once the new budget is set and any further sort of reductions that fall out of that it's not lost on us and surely not lost on yourselves the contrast we that face where we're seeing reducing police numbers and an outlook that is stark whereas in england and wales there's over two billion pounds being committed to the growth of both police officer numbers and the capability of the police service across a range of different things. And I think that's a point that we need to remind ourselves on. And equally, 
whilst we remain committed to doing all we can, we'll touch upon that a little later with some headlines from the Peel inspection that's just finished. Crime is up, the number of emergency calls we deal with is up, and increasingly that will create pressure in the system as we have fewer people to do more work. But as you've seen from this week, uh, we keep going and we've done some tremendous work. I think first of all, in an operational sense, um, we're really pleased to announce that really as we sit here, there's a man charged with Natalie's murder. It's been a complex case. Clearly now we're in live proceedings, there'll be limits to what we can say today. But absolutely, this is a devastating time for, for Natalie's family and for the community, and we extend our condolences to, to them at the moment. Um, you touched upon before, Chair, the environment which we're working. I started a week with commentary on the fact that in a week, and this was before the stabbing of two police officers yesterday, we'd had 43 officers injured in various ways in, in the space of a week, and clearly no one comes to work expecting to go home hurt for just trying to do their job. We had officers hospitalised uh, or suffering a range of different injuries, and then we had the awful events of, of, of yesterday. Um, again, that is an issue we take really seriously. Certainly, as a senior team, I think it's about reassuring our colleagues, but also the public, that we take the health and safety of our officers and staff really, really seriously. It is worth saying that we are probably the best trained and equipped police service in the UK given the range of different protective measures we have to support officers. And we're already committed to keeping those issues under review, particularly in relation to recent commentary on the issue of conducted energy devices. Um, I think the issue that we would welcome resolution is the extent matters of pay. And clearly there's a whole raft of issues in both the public and private sector at the moment. But in terms of feeling valued, I know that there's increasing concern and pressure from the Police Federation not, and the Superintendents Association that we see a remedy to the this year's pay award being announced and supported and clearly for NIPSA colleagues that there's a whole different route at the moment as they've gone to ballot so the, the whole industrial relations piece will remain important for us. Um, certainly today there'll be a, an opportunity to update on some of the wider issues you touched in your introduction around police use of powers. We take that matter really seriously. I know Chris, who's here today, has previously talked about the extra scrutiny that we're doing to this important area of police work. But again, to give you some further reassurance about the issue, particularly of strip searches and, and the data quality that goes with that, Chris will be able to update you later. Um, certainly on the horizon, there's, there's a lot to keep in, in the centre of the room. Clearly, there's huge expectations around the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement and the policing consequences that may come from that. And also, as I've said, we await, like all parts of the public sector, in terms of clarity to what our new budget will be going into the 23-24 financial year. Um, we've had some constructive feedback from Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary Fire and Rescue Service on the sort of outworkings of the Peel inspection. Um, probably best to deal with that in the private session, Chair, because it is sort of headlines, we haven't received the report, there'll be a whole process to go through yet to get the report back to us, fact-checked and then agreed and moderated. So it'll be a while before you see the actual results. But given some of your concern and the public concern, particularly around professional standards and vetting, I think there are some headlines we can appropriately share in, in that session. Uh, and then finally, I, I think we recognise, again, probably as we sit here today, key announcements in matters related to legacy. And again, there'll be an issue that may be subject of further inquiry this morning and then beyond, depending on what is said in relation to some particularly important cases that are running today. Thank you, Chief Constable. We'll come across to members now for some questions. Um, Nuda from Nuda, an update on the murder of Natalie McNally. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Chief Constable, for the introduction. Um, and you did make some comments already about um, the brutal murder of Natalie McNally and our thoughts and support to Natalie's family um, that we have now and will be ongoing. I just want to ask a question um, if you can provide, and I appreciate that it's ongoing proceedings and may be limited in what you can say, but if you can provide the board um, with any more update, um, not only on the, the murder investigation, but also um, on the support that is being given to Natalie's um, family um, at this time. Thanks. Well, I think in fairness, I can't really say much more about the investigation itself because um, that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, clearly, Mark is, is here. I, know I visited the murder inquiry team myself Friday night uh, and saw the determination and tenacity which they were 
applying to this investigation. Uh, there are standardised processes for support to people that suffer this awful experience in terms of family liaison and officers. I know that process has been engaged and has been working well. So um, I think that's about as much as we can say today. Is that fair, Mark? Yes, Chief. I, I think um, so. There is someone in, uh, who's been charged, and we have been charged, and will be appearing in Lisburn Court this morning. Um, the, the team, as the Chief have said, supported by the rest of the organisation, have worked tirelessly on this. This is an important and significant um, part of the process for Natalie and for the family. But we will continue now with the criminal justice process so that the work continues. Um, and that's all we can say at this point. Thank you for that. I'm going to move on to Michael on a question on the resource allocation model and a couple of supplementaries from other members. Hi, good morning, Chief Constable. Um, just in terms of uh, the context, the monthly report to the board, uh, page seven, refers to service impact analysis using the resource allocation model and the intention to protect key areas uh, of service in the face of the budgetary pressures. However, I do expect that there may be opportunities to exploit emerging technologies or, or adopt more innovative approaches, recognizing the shift in the nature of crime as well. And the question then is, um, might the Chief Constable give the board some reassurance around plans to further develop the strategic, analytical and development type capacity and expertise within the organisation to counter some of the challenging resource uh, reductions? Thank you. Yes, that's Sorry, because um, yeah, well, certainly you'll know from the past um, my own sort of enthusiasm for I think what we banded is digital policing. Um, I think there's a real place to improve productivity across the range with investment in technology, regardless of the financial situation we find ourselves in. So um, Pamela obviously is doing a lot of work with the team and race the whole thing, but I think there's, there's A, there's the investment we've already made. So now that every offer, operation officer has access to either a tough book, a digital notebook, or a, a laptop. With the laptops actually at the moment are just being upgraded to give them better connectivity and speed them up. And you will see yourselves, and we welcome visits into the, into the operational space from members just to see how some of this technology is applied real time and some actually quite innovative uses of it. I was out on patrol Friday, Friday night, uh, seeing some how the new Origin app works on the digital notebook, very, very speedy. Um, similarly, uh, Chris is looking at some work as how we, again, if you like, improve our return on investment in technology like automatic number plate recognition, because I think that's a, a key crime fighting tool. And then um, behind the scenes, um, and again, members are welcome to have a look at this. You, you know we've been effectively improving our data warehouse called Pulse, the performance management system. That is a iterative process um, to make sure that we try and operationalize as much of the huge amounts of data that we actually hold to move us away from spreadsheets to push information near real time to decision makers. And then sort of, I think the psychological jargon to visualize it so that it's really easy to use and understand. So there, there are some sort of key areas of work which we would continue to sort of prosecute notwithstanding the, the financial situation. But I think there's a marker as well in terms of it won't replace the activity of all those people. It will just make what we do smarter. Uh, two other quick points, I think. One of my personal sort of commitment to this year is to do all we can internally to reduce bureaucracy. Um, there's often a lot of talk about bureaucracy in the wider system, but my own experience is often we create a lot ourselves and you just don't realise it's something you were doing 10 years ago you don't need anymore. And also, in fairness, we've got some real improvements around data sharing with the criminal justice service or system. So we've got a new sort of software now called Box, which enables us to upload uh, its files into the PPS instantly. Uh, that's seeing improvements in terms of the exchange of information between partners. And I think finally, the plea to everybody, because we can all probably help in this. We've remember a couple of months ago, we launched our new website. Alan uh, is been doing a lot of work on this with Jenny from Strategic Comms. This will be again a phased process, but the, the underpinning assumption in there is A, to make access to information easier. So if people are asking questions, where's the policy? There's quite a good search engine there now to help you find information which reduces things like FOIs, but also to increase the amount of if like transactional service the public can do with this, whether it's paying a fine, 
applying for firearms license, uploading digital information. So we see that as a key development in the year ahead. So there's quite a lot we're doing in that space. Just one point I'd make on a, a positive note. I, I visited some of your team up at uh, Derry Stroke London there in Monday, and they were talking about the benefits of the cybercrime support unit that they have access to now and the amount of time and efficiency that that's saving. I suppose it's just to make sure that we don't lose some of that momentum or maybe lose resources in those areas, which are actually really helpful uh, moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and Les, the uh, supplementary to this. Okay, John. Chair, uh, thank you. Um, before I ask you the supplementary question, I want to associate myself and Alliance with the comments made by yourself at the start, uh, expressing support to those officers attacked and injured in recent days. And I'm sure the Chief Constable and the senior team will take the wishes of this board back back to those affected. The question is directly in relation to pay. The Chief Constable in his opening remarks addressed the issue of the outstanding pay award for this year. I asked the question previously on uh, the pay points, particularly at the probationary and commencement grades. Can I ask if there's been any progress made on that that can be reported? Yeah, I think yes and no, but I'll bring Pamela in. Oh, Claire. Yeah, sorry, Claire. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, John. Um, so I can confirm that through our own internal governance processes, we have agreed that from April 2023 onwards, student officers will commence on point 1B of the pay spine, previously point 1. However, we do have to have departmental approval to implement that. We've submitted that case to the department and it's under consideration, but we're acutely aware of the impact of the cost of living crisis and the need to have a meaningful remuneration package for people who want to, to commence on, in a career in policing. Um, you know, we were comparing to other professions like health and teaching, for example. So it was very important for us to ensure that the starting salary for student officers um, did not, in particular, fall below the, the minimum wage that comes in in April. And we're, you know, we're very pleased to be able to take that forward, but we await approval so that we can actually implement it. Okay. Content, John. Sharon. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to professional standards now. And the first question is from Ed. Edgar. Jeff, thanks very much for your report. And my question is in relation to uh, you, you advise the board of your decision to review previous cases of sexual impropriety and misconduct against uh, alleged against PSNI personnel over the past 10 years to ensure appropriate investigative actions and safeguarding were addressed and identify any areas for improvement within the systems used within PSD. Uh, can you provide the board with uh, an update on this work? For example, uh, how many cases are included in the review? And are there any lessons to be drawn from the work to date? Yes, thank you. Edgar. I think probably best to bring Mark in because he's been doing a lot of work in this space in relation to uh, what we call Operation Rorick with uh, Chief Superintendent Simon Wall. So, Mark, do you want to give some detail? Yes, yeah, so I mean, the total number of cases under review, Edgar, is 126 cases. Uh, over the period, um, we've completed reports on 20 of the cases which relate to 23 officers um, and there are various investigative actions so the case would either be closed again because actually we're satisfied that all relevant actions have been carried out, other cases have been referred then for additional investigation and some come back to me. So that process is ongoing, it's robust. I think, I mean there's a number of questions I'm sure the board have about professional standards and assurance processes at this time. So. HMIC have just finished their inspection of professional standards. They've come back to do a couple more uh, questions around some of our vetting. Um, but the assurance process that we're hopefully going to prove to you will be in a couple of months' time because they will have looked at everything we're doing. They have looked at the caseload and professional standards. They have looked at the robustness of the investigations. They have looked at the appropriateness of the decision making by professional standards. They have looked at uh, the standards that have been set by the Chief Constable for the service. They have pressure tested those in focus groups around the organization to see how well they're understood by, uh, by our staff. Uh, and uh, as I say, the, we've had a hot debrief from them. We will happily talk to you about some of that, but um, 
hopefully the assurances that the board needs about the um, operation of professional standards but will come through that process, having been fully tested last week by HMIC. Thank you. And in a similar vein from Michael on professional standards. Okay, thank you, um, Chief. And we've touched there with Mark on the uh, operation of your act, but I suppose what I just wanted to focus in particularly on was that given the length of time, some of the bad behaviours um, may have been around the organisation and unknown to us, I suppose it does raise a question uh, around the confidence that PSNI officers and staff may have around confidentiality, possible reprisal uh, in bringing forward disclosures. And just looking back there to the recommendations within the recent board review of uh, PSNI professional standards in late 2022, and there's an imminent review of PSNI whistleblowing policy ongoing. Might the Chief Constable give the board assurance that the mechanisms available within PSNI are being pressure tested to ensure that those who wish to come forward are adequately protected? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, again, uh, I'm sure Mark will have a lot of detail on this. Suffice to say, with the caveat that we don't want to go too far in public for someone who's been said to us as a hot debrief, uh, but I can assure you that the, the inspection last week was very thorough and addressed all of those issues, and we were given good assurances, very good assurances in terms of what we're doing. I think it is important to recognise, though, that, that people perceive these things in different ways. So, you know, I have to be able to convince every member of the workforce that it's safe to come forward and raise a concern or to use your statutory rights as a whistleblower. Uh, and, it, and that's not lost on me. Um, so, you know, we are at the final stages of reviewing the whistleblowing policy. Um, we then have to have a very vigorous communications process around the review, but there is a process in place. It's just it's being updated. Um, we will help people understand the difference between being a statutory whistleblower and also just raising concerns. Um, there are also differences in our workforce between, at points, the legal duty of police officers and the duties of police staff, because we are uh, police officers have a different duty around criminality. Um, uh, we have a number of mechanisms to raise an issue. We have confidential telephone lines, anti-corruption. We also have an integrity matter button to press on our intranet. Um, we're developing an app so that you can report integrity matters via police mobile phone. Um, and uh, so there, there's lots of vehicles. The question really is, is, is it, are people confident in using them? Now, uh, even set aside what the HMIC has seen last week, as the person who examines all the all the recommendations for suspension and repossession that come forward for gross misconduct. I'm getting more and more cases that are being reported by other officers. Uh, you know, in my time in doing this, probably for well over 10 years at times, uh, you know, there is a clear pattern of more issues being raised by the workforce within the workforce. Uh, and, um, and I think that's, that's, that should be a reassuring process as well. Uh, and that hopefully coupled with, so the piece of work we're doing, the HMIC report and our ongoing reports to the, to the board, I think, should be of assurance. Um, and then I think probably we, we can also look at whether or not there is a continuous kind of, as you, as you describe it, pressure testing process that we can put into this. Uh, I don't really want to just do this and say it's done and then assume that everybody has um, bought into it, so to speak. But I'm, 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 I'm much happier than it would have been a number of years ago about, about how far this is reaching the organisation and people's confidence coming forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have a question from Trevor on discipline. Thank you, Terence. Actually, from a party colleague, who, there's no Zoom facility, so she can be here. So she's asked me to ask you a very specific question, detailed question. So that's okay, Chief. Given the number of high profile disciplinary and criminal cases um, against PSNI officers, the falling of the failing, sorry, falling of officer numbers, uh, pay and resources, and the low morale within the ranks. Uh, what reassurance can the chief constable give us that as junior officers, that when it comes and as junior officers, when it comes to discipline and treatment of officers accused of a crime, everyone is treated with the same, regardless of their rank? And how he intends to address what appears to be slipping standards within the service? And thirdly, what is it considered to be at the root cause of the problems? Thanks, Trevor. Um, with a very broad question there. Firstly, 
in terms of uh, reassurance about treatment, uh, you know, you will see in due course the assurance we've had from HMIC, so they're probably best placed to give you that independence rather than just listen to what we, we would say. Members will obviously be aware that the, the police conduct regulations are a very clear regulatory framework, um, and they sort of set out steps in that framework about a, what it's there to do, um, which we have to remind people is about raising confidence and setting standards, so the punishment is a, seen as a sidebar, although it's part of the, the, the options available to, um, to panel members who sit in that space to hearing. Um, similarly, I know from the work that Mark does that, um, that, that there is a lot of rigour to the various decision-making points, and equally, uh, we have to take each case on its merits. So there are different decision points where decisions can be made, changed, so it's not just a natural flight path from A to B. So, and there's a lot of case law that surrounds what we can and can't do in relation to how we treat officers that accuse of misconduct. Because on the one hand, it's about preserving public confidence that we take this matter seriously and we do retain high standards for policing because of the well-rehearsed argument about you know, we have unique privilege in, in terms of a range of powers on behalf of the public to keep them safe and we should use that. Um, equally, in terms of how we, we apply the, the sort of standards across different ranks and grades, because there's separate arrangements, obviously, for police staff, well, the, sometimes rank can be an aggravating factor uh, when people sit in a hearing, because there are different tests we have to satisfy ourselves in decision-making points. In terms of the root causes, well, then, again, we could probably be here for quite a long time because it's a hugely important issue. I think the first thing we have to recognise is that policing is reflective of society. We recruit from the public, and whilst we will set standards at the point of induction, um, we are sometimes obviously dealing with human beings with human frailties. Uh, but equally, standards have changed and shifted. Yeah. And equally, as you've said before, things like new technology in the last decade has opened up a space for people to, if you like, codify things that may have been said in a bar 10 years ago and on a WhatsApp message. So our job really is to continue to remind people about what is acceptable and what isn't. And again, one of the things we talked from last week, you remember we came almost a year ago with our statement of intent that the Mark Pandler and I sort of signed to put a name to, absolutely unequivocal evidence from HMIC that A, it was known and understood and it was influencing people's behavior and was linked to increases in reporting. So that there was a lot at play here and clearly, as Mark said, it's just because we've been through an inspection, it's not sort of job done, we'll move on to the next issue. This is an enduring campaign to satisfy yourselves and the public that we will recruit people with high standards, we will support them where we can to be the best police officers that you would expect to, to police the streets. Clearly, resourcing will produce different pressures. You shouldn't anticipate that less people will mean sort of lower standards because we're not, not in that space. And I know so for almost the daily efforts that Mark and the team will do that when information comes in, it is rigorously assessed to make sure there are no gaps and we're acting quickly to the information before us. But I've said quite a lot there, but I don't know if Mark wants to add anything else. I, I think it's a, really, it's a very pertinent question, Trevor. It's one of on the kind of rank issue, whenever I last looked at proportions of suspensions, repositions per per rank, they're just as high in the senior ranks as they're actually higher proportionally than when you cross into the junior ranks. When you look at the numbers of people against the total number of people in those ranks, um, and uh, you know, I, I also would want the board to know that you know that the, the decision making process around this, you know. Rank is, is 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 regarded as an aggravating factor, not a diminishing factor. It makes it worse, not better, and that's the thing that this board needs to know about. It doesn't all you know. It's, it's the complete opposite uh, in terms of uh, how the public interest test is applied and how we we look at the code of ethics. Uh, the other thing I'll say in my experience as a police officer uh, is that. There are things now that police officers are doing that couldn't have been done years ago, and then most of that involves the use of social media and electronic devices. So there is there is a world of behaviour that that has that has evolved in our society over the last dozen years that didn't exist before, and inside that, then there are, there are misconduct 
uh, activities and potentially criminal activities that didn't exist before. Um, and, uh, and some of this is exclusive to the police service, some of it's not. Some of it's probably then exclusive to the uniform services, and some of it's not. Um, but in a pattern of stuff, there's a clear pattern there of, of issues that just didn't exist. The second thing is that in our society, uh, we have patterns of criminality that go underreported, uh, not just in the police service, but across communities, <laughs> particularly domestic abuse and sexual abuse. So um, it is only but right that in, a, that in a society now that is calling out these issues, wherever they exist, that they are called out inside a police service. So because you wear a uniform and go home at night and then carry uh, crimes against your family or against your loved ones doesn't mean that there should be a shield. Um, and, uh, and that's a societal issue, but also one for us as an organization. So we are seeing more reporting of these types of offenses in our societies generally. But obviously, we are able quite fortuitously to categorize this, uh, this, 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 some of these offenses against employment, which we don't, we're, which we don't do for any other real category in our society. And there's an appropriateness for why we do it for the police service. So those are differences, Trevor. I think so. More reporting for stuff that wasn't reported, a calling out of behaviours in our own society, which is also present in the police. We accept that, and also types of offences that actually just are new. Um, uh, right, and even the very, even the very differences in GDPR, data protection, the use of information, you know, those those environments are far more rigorous than they're everywhere, and therefore people are falling foul of it, despite being warned. And I suppose that's the other thing is there's nothing here that a police officer really should say they didn't know was wrong. Uh, and uh, so those are those are fundamental differences. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, and now to Jerry on extension of that. Yeah, just uh, intelligent. Thank you for for the uh, the rundown and all of that. As you know, it's very hard to help. I just want to ask you. Uh, it was mentioned a couple of times earlier, Chief uh, Constable, about uh, police staff and police officers, and there is a difference. And sort of fairly briefly, if you could point that out, really for the public and that to, to see what that is. But the other thing in, in both cases is time frames, as you know, are are a, a huge uh, a huge issue. And in, in terms of the protection of police officers and, and for the public conference as well, um, because these times can go on, I mean, must have an effect on a police officer who's innocent and goes on for some times, sometimes years. Um, is, is that improving? Are we doing something about that? Thank you. Yeah, well, if it's just to go last first, really, because um, certainly we're conscious for all sorts of reasons that if, if you're on the purview of being investigated, that there's a stress and a pressure, um, particularly if you go through that process and not every police officer investigated is actually guilty of something and they're cleared because I think the other thing to remind ourselves is that the bar for putting a police officer in play for misconduct, a case to answer test, is a very low one because I think the regulations talk about or the interpretation of the case law if on one version of the facts there could be a case to answer for misconduct. Um, you sort of begin the process. Um, I, I think for all sorts of reasons, um, we, we are conscious that the speedy resolution for this is in everybody's interests. Uh, and again, Mark wanted to come in, that work he's done, certainly with Simon Walls, to, to, to look at the daily scrutiny of investigations within professional standards. Uh, what we're doing in relation to gathering information, disclosure to third parties to speed up the investigations. But it also has to be said, as you know, there were two other key players on the pitch, the police ombudsman and the public prosecution service, who in many of the cases are key to decision making, which then affects the progress. So um, I, I think that's an area for further explanation, but it's, it's not something we can directly influence. Clearly, in terms of police and police staff, well, obviously, we, we employ the whole workforce and people want the confidence that the whole workforce understands standards expectations, behaviours, but effectively the codes are different for police officers and their behaviour than the sort of the arrangements we, we have for police staff. Um, and that's something that obviously we are actually doing some work at the moment through Claire to look at alignment between, the, 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 we will never merge the two standards if you like, but the alignment between what we're doing and things that happen in the middle. So where you haven't got necessarily direct evidence of misconduct, but how we're using the grievance process effectively and proportionately 
because that's all so part of the continuum. Or actually, I was uh, earlier this week just um, seeing we've launched something new, uh, a course for first line supervisors. Uh, and part of that is actually better education about how to manage conflict in the workplace, because sometimes it can be dealt with appropriately by prevention or education real time as opposed to letting things fester that end up either in more serious matters up to tribunals or indeed uh, into misconduct. So there's a few other bits there. So I don't know whether Claire or Mark want to add anything or something else. Just to clarify what I was saying is that a police officer's statutory duty under the Police Act to the prevention and investigation of crime, our police staff don't. You know, so you know the argument in PSD would be that the Code of Ethics requires police officers to report wrongdoing, criminality, that, that there's, there's, a, there's a statute, there's a duty on us that isn't necessarily reflected as a duty of everybody else because police staff aren't police officers, they're not, they're not attested for the role. So we would argue that police officers have a slightly, uh, have, 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 have a greater duty to report crime, criminality. Um, the speeding of the cases, so um, one of the things that that over the last two or three years, uh, we've recognized that since the 2016 regulations, um, we were not using special case hearings as vigorously as we could. So 18 months ago, we accelerated that process. So there's far more people now going to special case hearing, which is, which is where we can separate this off earlier and put them before the chief constable as opposed to before a full panel um, under certain criteria, and that does that has speed the case up. So there's a number, I mean, the chief did one effectively every month last year, which led to uh, a, a dismissal roughly every month. If those had been three panels, a lot of those people still would have been here because they just were, you know, we're trying to get a whole panel together. So we're using special case hearings uh, very vigorously. Um, uh, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say the HMIC have commented to us about delays in the system. Um, and they have identified also that the delay isn't just with us. Um, there are there are the where this becomes really complicated is is where it is criminal the criminal investigation alongside a misconduct investigation where it's pure misconduct and we're not having to interface with the rest of the justice system we can move much quicker generally not always but generally but where we're having to interface with another investigative agency uh, a prosecutorial agency and the courts then that then adds a lot more time to the process and those timings are not necessarily much different to what they would be if it wasn't a police criminal case. But then what happens is once the criminal element of that is done, then it has to revert back to the misconduct piece, which adds a bit more time again. So they, we've got the criminal bit and the employer bit, and the two of them together create delay, whereas the criminal bit on its own in our own justice system, I think we all admit, <laughs> is, is quite lengthy anyway. What we're trying to do is shorten the period of the employee, the employer bit for which we are responsible for every member of staff, um, but not responsible in every case for the criminal, criminal investigation because of the role of police ombudsman. I know there's more questions, but you, you just raised something there. So if, if there's a, a criminal aspect of it, then a police officer or police staff, and it's finished, and there's a, a guilty uh, um, verdict in the, the legal situation, how long then does that, does that sort out the conduct issue? Is it, so, so there's a process, but does that speed that process up? It, yes, it can do. So, uh, two bits there as well. So, a guilty a guilty outcome in a uh, criminal case could mean that if to that point, and this is, I mean, I don't want to be anyway case specific, anyway case specific, but it could mean that to that point, if we haven't been able to use a special case hearing, that we could we could consider because there has been a guilty outcome a special case hearing as the most, as the quickest way to expedite that case. Unless there are additional matters in the misconduct that, that mean that it can't get into a special case hearing, and we can brief on all of that. So it should mean that, it could, it could mean that. But what I would also say, Jerry, and this is the other difference where we have seen some additional delay. Pre-2016 regulations, we would rarely have taken misconduct action against somebody who's acquitted in court. However, even with an acquittal in court now, we will now we will also do a vigorous misconduct investigation to see, irrespective of the fact that they're acquitted in court, they have breached the code of ethics. The burden of proof in court is beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, the burden of proof for police misconduct is the balance of probability, which is a lower burden of proof. So, 
where there are people who are being acquitted in court, but who are still going through misconduct processes because there is sufficient, we feel, to indicate a breach of the Code of Ethics, and that is adding. So in the past, you might have just been sent back to work. That isn't happening in every case now. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Don Dula, on this topic, the last question on this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, you just raised a couple of issues there. Um, if the, also use the word bar, is, is obviously different. Surely there can be an aspect of parallel process that takes place to shorten then the time. But, but given the timeframes that we are seeing that a lot of the public interest is in, it just, we aren't seeing that, the public isn't seeing that, and that affects confidence. And then the other issue was um, that Jerry had raised about time frame, um, about people being kept abreast. But whenever there are issues of whistleblowers, complainants, who may also or may also or may not be the victim, to what extent are they actually being kept updated? Because we are hearing disturbing cases of which there is no update. Um, there are people feel that they are maybe not having their concerns addressed and things being dragged out. And of course, they are dedicated and they remain dedicated to their role within the police service, um, but want to see an outcome. And, and I think that needs to be properly dealt with in terms of the misconduct is not just about um, this specific officer, but is also about those who have come forward as well. Okay, so the parallel process question first. Um, so um, the balance of probabilities is the test for misconduct, the, the unreasonable doubt is the test for criminality. Um, however, and in the, if, we're trying to, if we want to do a process uh, misconduct parallel to the criminal, we have to satisfy uh, the, pro the process has to be satisfied that there is no prejudice to the criminal case by carrying out the misconduct case. So uh, we would have to satisfy yourself that a dismissal um, or a misconduct sanction for the offence or the less offence wouldn't have a disproportionate prejudicial impact upon the conduct of a criminal case. And we're required to do that as part of the assessment for a parallel process. So uh, where we can we try and disaggregate the two. So there may be examples where officers have a criminal process running and the PPS would agree with us that, that uh, we, can, we can proceed with misconduct, but we have to proceed with misconduct, deal with that, and, uh, but do it um, completely separate and, uh, and not publicize it. Or we could take offense, there may be a range of, of charges that the person is accused of, some of which are criminal and some which are not. And we think there's a strong enough case in the purely non-criminal to take those forward in advance of the criminal case as a separate as a separate piece, which we do as well. Deal with that conduct that may or may not lead to dismissal and then allow the criminal to proceed separately. It's very much on a case by case basis, it needs to be assessed by the appropriate authority on a case by case basis sometimes then supported by legal advice, often in conjunction with consultation with the Public Prosecution Service. And then a decision made by myself, um, in some cases for special case, if not uh, then by the AA. So it, we can't give a kind of one approach to it. Everything has to work its way through according to those prejudicial issues. On the whistleblowing piece, I'm very happy to, to talk about and private about any specific cases that you have and people who need to be updated. Um, you know, uh, one thing we sort of identified in the police service is that, I mean, not everybody agrees on this, but police service victims should be treated like any victim of crime. They should have the same contact points and same update points. Um, and, you know, there's obviously room for improvement there. Um, but there is also, when, I, when an investigation is ongoing and maybe uh, someone has been suspended, repositioned or is on investigation, there's not a lot then going to be said back to the complainant, as it would be in any, any case, other than just we should be updating them as to where the conduct issue is in the process. But I'm very happy to talk to you just about what, any improvements that could be made to that. Okay, thank you. And um, we're going to move on uh, to Mike uh, on a supplementary remark on strip searching of under 18s. Yeah, I'm disappointed to be returning to this, Simon, because you know we've already dealt with the misreporting of numbers in 2021. And then at the last meeting here, what I would call the misspeaking, when we discussed how many or how frequently an under 18 would decline to have an appropriate adult present. 
because uh, at one and the same time we were told it was often the case, but also that it was rare. And actually, based on the last information you've given us, neither of those answers was correct, because the answer is none, on no occasion, did an under-18 ask or decline the opportunity. So now we come to the reasons why strip searches were deemed to be urgent. And you've given me a written answer, and I'm going to read it into the record, Chair. It says, of the 26 strip searches carried out, 25 were considered urgent due to the fact that the detainee had been previously flagged as concealing either drugs or weapons that could be utilised to harm themselves or others. On the face of it, very reassuring. Here we have custody sergeants moving in a timely manner uh, to assess the risk level and react appropriately. But previously, you had written to a Belfast-based NGO, and the number of previously warned marks was 19. So 19, 25. Often the case, rare. Do you think you're developing a credibility issue? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Well, I haven't got the, the two replies in, in front of me, so without trying to sound defensive, there may be different time frames. But in, 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 in relation to the detail, I think it's easier to sort of ask Chris to come in to give some assurance about the what's and the why's, because the generation that starts this is how we are able to work within the PACE codes of practice. And you've got the balance, the expectations and duties that we put on a custody officer on the legitimate rights of someone under 17 in the framework. We have actually done, even since we last spoke, quite a bit of work on this. So it's probably easier, because I know you want assurance about sort of data accuracy, a robust process, because I know there'll be other members probably concerned that what this is. And also to remind people that the issue of strip search, even in its own language, is quite emotive. And it seems to be, you know, we all imagine something's really intrusive, but it does cover a range of interventions, uh, which could be as simple as looking down somebody's sock. So there is a, you know, it's not necessarily what you think it is, but Chris has done quite a bit here, probably anticipation of wanting further assurance. So I'll just bring him in to bring you up to speed with what that is. And if outside we need to check figures, we, we can do that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mike. Um, yes, so um, first of all, I think it was probably me that, that uh, was misrepresenting um, the information at the last board meeting. So I apologise for that. And, and I, I think I've written to you since then to offer that apology. Um, I, was, I was meaning to explain the, uh, the legal basis um, but uh, I accept that, that it was misconstrued. Um, so in, in relation to the subject itself, though, what, what I'd start with saying is that um, we're listening to the, um, the feedback that we're getting from yourself and from, from other board members and really grateful for that. And it is positively influencing the way in which we, we deal with this, this really um, serious and emotive issue. So um, since we, we, we first talked about this a, a number of boards uh, previous, we have introduced the service accountability panel um, that met in November for the first time and enabled me to drill down into each individual case where a strip search was conducted of a young person um, to, to ensure that we were, um, uh, our officers were behaving appropriately for the right reasons. That, that panel will be meeting again in February where we'll look at that further. We've realised that, that that in itself is, 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 is not enough. Um, that allows me to look back retrospectively. We need to have that assurance that each case, each live case at that time is, uh, is, is awarded the scrutiny that it deserves. So our colleagues in criminal justice have uh, introduced a new policy, which ensures that a pro forma is completed uh, on each occasion, uh, that this is deemed to be necessary, um, which in, ensures that the person responsible for that decision is recording a rationale as to why they think it's urgent, uh, whether they can get hold of an appropriate adult, uh, what measures have been put in place to get hold of an appropriate adult. Um, and we've given our people the assurance that they will have the resources to sit with a young person if necessary to wait for that appropriate adult. So all of this is designed to reduce the occasions in which a young person will be subject to a strip search if indeed it is deemed to be necessary. And I think we can go further and I'll be taking um, um, a recommendation to the Chief Constable through our Strategic Management Board to, to put a presumption uh, into our policy that a young person will not be subject to a strip search uh, unless there is appropriate adults present. 
but I do also need to listen to, to our colleagues um, who are dealing with very difficult circumstances um, and the legislation has been written into statute to afford the opportunity to remove items which may cause harm to a young person or to others when they are in our custody because we can't afford to have anybody hurt or seriously injured or worse whilst they are in our care. So, so it is there for a reason and we, it should only be used when absolutely strictly necessary and I think we've listened to, to the feedback that we've had from yourselves and from NGOs that we work with on a regular basis um, and we've changed our policy and we will take that further to ensure that that presumption is there. But the, as the Chief says, I think you know, the language itself can be very emotive. Um, often, clearly, um, the strip searches um, vary in degree. But, for example, if somebody's in custody and their socks and shoes have to be removed, then that is recorded as a strip search. If it's more, more serious than that, then the guidance um, is there to ensure that our officers must operate in a certain way which is designed to preserve the dignity of the people who are subject to such searches as much as is reasonably possible and that will always be followed. Well I, I very much welcome the fact that you're reviewing uh, your procedures in this very sensitive area. Two points if I may chair in conclusion. I, I still have reservations about the role of this service accountability panel whether it is complementing the work of the board or usurping the work of the board and I'd like to monitor that as we go forward. And in terms of the discrepancy between the 19 and 25, which has not been answered, uh, Chair, I would suggest it might be appropriate that our human rights advisor reviews the custody logs in these cases. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mark, was a supplementary for this? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, Chris, uh, for that answer. But uh, given what you've said there, Chris, around the, the use or stop search is only being used when absolutely and strictly necessary. If we look at the figures from the, the Children's Law Centre and those quoted by Mike of say 26 children strip searched in 20, 21 and 22, only one of whom was accompanied by an appropriate adult and in only three of those instances items of interest were found. Would you consider that the requirement of proportionality on the use of police powers is being upheld in this current practice of police powers. Thank you. Um, and uh, I should also make the point that I'll be uh, appearing before the performance committee next week as well, and no doubt we'll, we can drill down into some of the granular detail, and particularly the, the, the data that Mike refers to. But on, on, on the question of proportionality, I think it's important to note the, the changes that we have made, uh, and early indications are that uh, the situation is improving. So. Um, the, the cases that you mentioned there, the historical ones, um, they were all lawful um, and it's important that, that uh, the use of our powers is not just lawful but it's also proportionate um, and, and, it's, and it's conducted in a way which, which, which um, has humanity at, at its heart. So the, the, what we've seen recently, so in January for example, there has been one case uh, of a young person who was subject to a search of this nature uh, and an appropriate adult was present in that case. Uh, in December, um, so these, this is data that, that hasn't been presented to the board previously, there were four cases, um, and one of those cases, an appropriate adult was present, but three were not. Um, that's why we've brought in this new process in custody where the pro forma must be conducted and, and the, the rationale must be uh, recorded. But as I say, that's why we will also look at the presumption of an appropriate adult being present. So I think it's important that we, we recognise that we've listened, we've changed our processes, and we're seeking to uh, improve um, and treat every young person with, with dignity that's in our care. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. But just out of interest of those five recent instances, and how many of those cases were items of interest discovered? So two, two of the cases in December, um, there was uh, Class B drugs recovered in one case and there was Class A drugs and cash recovered in the other case. Uh, the one in January, nothing was recovered. Okay, thank you. And we're going to move on now to another topic on economic crime from Frank. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, good morning, Simon and team. Um, it was wonderful to read in your monthly report about the donation to um, wonderful charity Inspire, 
£108,000 as a result of the Economic Crime Unit. Um, I have two questions on the note kit once they come in with a supplementary as well. But my first one is, why does it look as if it was Wilson Auctions that were making the donation? Their names on the cheque, they signed off the cheque. I just think you're doing your people a disservice by not having it from your own people or from one of the PSCPs. Yeah. And secondly, could you share with the, the board here the scale of potential donations that can be given to charities through criminal assets, seized, sold, cash, whatever, on an annual basis? Maybe you want to listen to Kate's supplementary as well, because it all rolls into one. Is that okay, Chair? I think my question was just, um, Chief Constable, if we could understand how the police service decide uh, which charities are awarded the money and then decide what value to award to those charities. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, in relation to the the uh, who is on the check, I'll, we'll just have to have a look at that, Frank, because um, they, 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 they are the, the auction house that facilitate the sale. But if there's... Um, to, to everyone's agreement, if there's a sort of acceptable way of promoting what we we have done, as opposed to a third party, we'll, we'll, we'll take that away. Um, similarly, in terms of uh, scale, just bring Mark in really uh, to talk about the proceeds of crime process and uh, how we get there, and and then um, in relation to how the uh, the awards been made in in relation to this case in the process. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, so this is a process where when a under the Proceeds of Crime Act a forfeiture order is made at court, it's the judge who decides ultimately where this where this award goes. Um, and they may take um, uh, submissions for, from ourselves or from community groups. Uh, but the, the, the actual process is it, it's forfeited uh, and the money is then submitted to the Home Office. Um, and then a portion of the asset recovery uh, of the assets are, are given to the asset recovery incentivization scheme ordinarily. This is very unusual. This is an extraordinary donation and one that the judge did direct. Um, so this, this wouldn't be wouldn't be normal. So it is it's a fantastic outcome for, for a very well uh, well worthwhile charity, as you say. Uh, over the last six years there's been in total 120,000 pounds has been um, awarded through the economic crime unit. So I don't have the overall figures because the question submitted was around the economic crime unit. But of course, there are uh, proceeds of crime that are submitted from right across the organization um, that go into that scheme. Um, so we would have to come back to you in writing with the, with the overall amounts, Chair. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Kate for a safeguarding question. Thank you. Can I ask where I would find a copy of the safeguarding policy for children, young people and vulnerable adults, uh, which applies to PSNI officers and staff? I'm not referring to service instructions, but policies which reflect culture and practice within an organisation. And secondly, who is the PSNI safeguarding champion or designated child protection lead, please? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I'm, you've, I'll probably go and, you'll go and look now and you say it's, it's the wrong thing, but sort of I'm sure that the policy is actually on the internet. No, we're trying to push stuff there. You'll say it's not the right one, but <laughs> when we, uh, we sort of asked the question today, in relation to the safeguarding issue, if you're looking at, do you mean in a relation to internally around the workforce as opposed to the safeguarding issues? Well, that, that would be through uh, the work that Claire would, yeah. yeah. Um, I suppose in the first instance, just to clarify, we do not have any police staff or police officers here under 18, um, so we don't have anybody that falls into that that particular category. Obviously, we do have a range of welfare and wellbeing initiatives to support our entire workforce, and actually the work of our staff associations and support networks is really critical in this area as well for particular categories of staff and ensuring that um, we identify any particular needs for alerts that we should be aware of and identify the right uh, route for support. And we have a range of, of things that we do. We also have um, the requirement for every uh, member of our workforce to have a regular 
um, development review conversation with the line manager, which is a means of in you know checking in, uh, as well as for development and performance purposes. So um, I hope that goes some way to providing you with some assurances that we have a range of different ways to ensure the well-being and welfare of our entire workforce, um, and, and you know including people who may um, have a vulnerability of some description. And then just to ask, who is the safeguarding champion then for the PSNI, please? Well, again, I think it depends, obviously, if, you, if we're sort of outbound, it would be through Mark for the work through the public protection branch, which obviously covers the investigation of a, a range of serious offences, which we'll talk about here. And then in relation to other behaviours, it would depend on where that is. But you wanted to come in on that? I, I mean... Our safeguarding champion is the Chief Superintendent for Protection. Um, but if the question is sort of internal safeguarding, we don't have a I don't have an internal safeguarding champion for the workforce. No, we we wouldn't we haven't operationalized that. We never have that. Thank you. And so then the, the question that I had around safeguarding uh, children was we heard yesterday at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee of the ongoing criminal exploitation of children. It was identified that the national referral mechanism has never been used in Northern Ireland uh, to safeguard a child or a young adult who may not be aware um, that they've been trafficked or exploited, may have consented by coercion um, to elements of their exploitation or have accepted their situation as inevitable. What plans do the police have to ensure the safeguarding of children who are being criminalised? Yeah, we, we, there's, there was actually a lot would happen in this space. I wanted to bring Mark in to, in terms of the work that the Paramilitary Crime Task Force do do and other NGOs we work with. Yes, so I mean we work very closely with uh, Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland and through the Papani arrangements in Northern Ireland. So I'm not entirely sure which uh, safeguarding referral mechanism we're, we're, we're talking about. I know in terms of uh, child criminal exploitation, there is a working group um, and, and work being undertaken by Department of Justice um, around young people who are being discriminated against by um, paramilitaries and organised crime groups. Um, we have a very sharp focus on this through the Paramilitary Crime Task Force and we seek to, to safeguard people both through those traditional safeguarding routes through our support hubs and also then it is, it is an element of our investigations when we are undertaking investigations into those groups. Um, so I'm not entirely sure about the, the specific referral mechanism. Um, when we, we're fully engaged with the, the Department of Justice and their uh, working group, but we don't see the, um, the county lines type child exploitation in Northern Ireland that, that we would see in, in GB. So that's a slightly different uh, scenario. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to Mark and a question on legacy. Thank you, Chair. Chief Constable, uh, you preempted that there might be a question on legacy and it probably wasn't that difficult given that only today in the news we're hearing from the Oma families, the family of Aidan McInnesby and the, the Guildford Four and the reason that these cases and, and so many others like them are never far from the public domain is because it's always, I'm sure you'll agree with me, in the public interest to get a truth and justice. Now, the London Legacy Bill is back before the House of Lords uh, this week and just last week. The Victims Commissioner here said that the bill should be withdrawn. That was further to his comment earlier last month that, and I'll quote, they hadn't heard anything coming from government to say that this bill will work for victims and survivors. Have you, uh, Chief Constable, heard anything to say or even suggest that the bill will work for victims and survivors? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Well, obviously, you know, without seeing, is the mic still on? So, um, without seeing if there's actually news as we we speak here, because it is an important day for various reasons for for legacy related matters. Um, I think there's a few things to sort of stress. I mean, I think obviously acutely aware of the environment in which this legislation is is being considered and interpreted across Northern Ireland, and you know, it's it's a matter of public commentary that there isn't widespread support for the proposals. In relation to the police services position though, that we've said more than once that we are here to reflect the sort of the will of parliament and the rule of law so that we currently investigate crimes that have happened in the past and we will respect what happens in the future. And I don't think it's appropriate 
given our institutional positions and the legislature that goes with it, that we go further than that. We're obviously um, in touch through various means through the work that Alan does, uh, is lost in, <laughs> through Legacy Investigations Branch and what Mark had done and the specific work that we commissioned out, which has been talked about a number of times in here through uh, what's euphemistically usually known as Operation Canova. So we're very much in the real time space, but we'll wait and see uh, what announcements are made that will affect uh, views of various groups, either in the next few days with the OMA bomb announcement and also as the legislation is finalised. Do you want to say anything else, Alan? Or? Just to expand, Chief, on your point and for the benefit of the board, um, we have been involved in various conversations over time, uh, Mark, but to be absolutely clear in our role in that, we're only advising on how we see the impact of any different proposals. We're not shaping those proposals, we're not designing them, and we're not a partner in that design uh, because our independence as a police service uh, relies on us having a statutory framework to conduct our duties within, and we're very clear about that, that we will, as a professional duty, advise people on impacts and or consequences. How those are weighed and how those reflect in legislation aren't a matter of the police service, and we've stayed out of that space. Uh, thanks, Chief Constable, uh, and thanks, Alan. I, I, I recognise your position, but I should recall that the Deputy Chief Constable did say last June, and again we'll quote, the trust and confidence in these processes is absolutely critical. And as the Victims Commissioner uh, made clear just last week, and as countless victims and survivors have made clear, confidence is overwhelmingly absent. So given the standard set by the PSNA to judge the legacy bill, can you now say, or is this going too far, that it's the view of the PSNA that that confidence that is absolutely critical does not exist. Thanks, Mark. It's probably best that Mark just explains what he said. Was it last September? Um, you know, the world may have moved on. I don't know, but I think our position overall is is the same. Well, first of all, I stand by my comments, um, and I think I also said, and you've, you've got the better of me, Mark, because I don't have a transcript of what I said. <laughs> I only got in my head, but. Uh, I think I was probably also said that we haven't received from any victims group um, supportive comments about the bill. You know, so I mean, we can go as far to say that you know we haven't, we're not in receipt of of of, of that. And and you know what we also said, or what I also said, is when you, when we're not we're not blind, unseeing or unhearing as to what goes on in our community. So you know we know exactly what sentiments are being expressed by victims groups across this community. We can see that and we hear that. But equally we took the position then and remain now that the actual the outworking of this bill is a matter for the government uh, and other justice agencies have taken the similar position. Um, but I do completely accept that the trust and confidence of victims is fundamental to any criminal justice process and I don't think we would deviate from that at all. Certainly I would have, even I haven't we haven't discussed this, Chief, so I don't know if it may, but I I think that's 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 crucial in Northern Ireland at the minute. Okay, thank you. Um thanks for that. I'm gonna move on to Nula and the question on Operation Yurta. Thank you, Chair. Um um, the Chief will be aware that um, a number of weeks ago when um, the Board's Human Rights Report was published that then there was public um, interest in, and inquiries made around um, Operation Yurta's uh, Lessons Learned um, review. Um, I was disappointed al along with others to understand that both Barry and Trevor were not you know, made aware of what was actually going on and, and as I wasn't there as a board member but you know as board members we um, do respect that there was an investigation and perhaps there are other questions um, for me as well as to what perhaps that investigation perhaps should have looked at instead and we know that the issue isn't closed it hopefully should be coming back to the boards very soon on the recommendations um, but in terms of confidence in policing and the major aspects of this case and what followed after and the impact that it has in confidence and policing, not just with the public, but also when it comes to freedom of expression, freedom of, of press, that why was there no communication and perhaps are there lessons to be learned about that communication um, to both Trevor and Barry? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I'm not aware of what the gap would be there, but certainly happy to follow it up outside if there's 
if there's somebody, because clearly there are a number of issues that have gone on and I'll be cautious in what I say because, you know, there was engagement in another process with, with, with the people that we're talking about. And I don't really want to go and open that sort of issue today. But equally, Mark, uh, with independent legal advice, sort of commissioned the lessons learned. I know it's re repeatedly sort of updated the board, but whether there's anything else you want to add to the position we're in, if we can provide some more information at the next relevant committee meeting, it might be the sort of germane opportunity to do that. But there may be a few other bits that Mark can add. Well, no, I mean, firstly, um, I would want to reassure everyone that there was no intention to exclude anybody. It was, it, was a, it was effectively a desktop examination of the legal case by a lawyer that went through all the, the legal statutes the, and effectively the judgment of the court and the workings of the litigation. Um, nobody was interviewed as a part of the process. Um, um, and uh, none of the sort of setting outside the, the issues that very pertinent to the journalists and the the position that we've taken on that, um, <coughs> none of the protagonists were interviewed. So it was that was the report was 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 carried on that basis. Um, if it was an omission on our part to to at least inform um, the journalists, then I accept that. But it certainly wasn't a deliberate omission. Um, and the board we had we had talked to the board about a lessons learned process for the police service. Um, uh, we commissioned a terms of reference. We talked to the board about that. The, the board worked with us to amend that terms of reference, um, and the report was was produced. and the uh, And then we have the remedial pieces of work that, that were started before the report. Uh, we're supported by uh, QC, not KC, um, in training and development for the organisation. So it was not basis that it was it was it was commissioned, um, uh, but it was no deliberate attempt to exclude anybody, it was that was just the basis on which we did it. I'll oh, just just quickly and yeah. Um, yeah, no, I I don't um I don't I'm not saying that there was an, a deliberate intention, but given it was such a high profile and area of interest that there perhaps should have been that even if it was a as you say desktop exercise, it still has ramifications on moving forward in learning lessons and ensuring that those are, are implemented. Um, so that's, I think, the crux of, of that issue is that the apology from the PSNI, you know, whilst being accepted, it, it didn't end or cease relationships to ensure that the things are implemented and how we move forward. Uh, I accept that. Thank you very much. Um, and just folks in the interest of time, you know, answers and questions, can, uh, a couple of questions go through. If you could keep them tight, it'd be great. Uh, Jerry on domestic violence. Uh, good morning, Harvey. Um, over the Christmas uh, period, I think it was reported there was over 3,600 um, calls for help to the police in terms of uh, domestic abuse. 753 arrests were made for domestic violence and 340 uh, resulted in a charge. And, and there's two parts of the question. The other thing is that there was 3% increase in the repeat offending rate on domestic abuse in the last six months. Um, could you explain or, or elaborate on that a wee bit, why that there's a gap between 753 and uh, 340? And I think the repeat offending might enter into that. Um, it might mean that we need better information because I'm presuming, I'm making the results of what I'm asking the question, that some of that is to do with repeat offending. Yeah, thanks, Joe. and thanks for raising what uh, you know is sadly pretty a, a really important issue and takes us back to one of the keynote things we did last year in the um, the new action plan to tackle violence against women and girls. Um, I think, in the spirit of the chair's prompt about timeliness, it may be something that either we can write to with uh, some of the work we've done to understand why, for example, in cases like this, there isn't always a transition from an allegation to a charge. We've done some quite detailed work. Uh, and similarly, the work we've been doing on repeat offenders. Sadly, there was always an anticipation, because we've reported this in the, in the umbrella of Tis the Season sort of campaign, that at Christmas and New Year, you will anticipate to see rises in domestic abuse simply because families are together and, 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 and sadly, uh, pe people are hurt. Um, certainly to reassure the board that, uh, again, through uh, work that we've been doing with HMI and other places. We're only discussing this with the Criminal Justice Board the other day. 
our outcome rates or charges re remain far in excess of you'll see in many other places across GB. So that whilst there was always more to do to close the gap between incident and charge. Uh, we're also doing work with the public prosecutions service to see, as you know now, that most events that we will turn up to, we will see on body one video. So can we introduce uh, different routes to prosecution if it's in the public interest, even if the victim does not want to make a statement, or we can use evidence from the scene to support that prosecution. Um, so the specifics, I think, is better in a written answer unless Mark wants to add anything at the moment, because there is some detail either to you directly or through performance committee if you want a, a deeper look at all the stuff we're doing and understand the reasons why people don't always go the whole way to support the prosecution because uh, Anthony Nam McNally's done a lot of work on this. Okay, thank you, um, Chief Councilor. But, but look, let me let me make two points. What, one is it, the statistics set we have in front of us. Um, it needs to be more for the benefit of yourselves, but also for the benefit of us to understand it. it needs to be more detailed in in that sense. And then could we could we have that uh, in in terms of of, of going forward? So I think I come in. Yes, Chair, we, we, we do provide these uh, more detail, as you know, um, Chair, at Performance Committee. One thing I would say is part of our big drive collectively has been to increase reporting. So some of the increase in reporting um, is, is certainly a welcome figure. Um, we will absolutely um, seek to deliver more information about the breakdown of this and what it means. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Trevor, and it's under Assaults on Officers and Tasers. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chief Constable, uh, I, I noticed you had tweet, a tweet out on, on terms of 43 officers, and you've referenced those today again. And then we obviously heard the news yesterday of the more serious uh, incident in relation to the two officers in South Belfast. And I would like to concur with John's remarks and be associated with those and the best wishes to those, and indeed of all of the 43 officers. Um, but in, in relation to all of those numbers, which are scary as an outsider just looking in, is there, are you seeing a pattern of what the assaults are about? Is there a reason, a particular reasons, whether it be drugs, whether it be mental health, whether it be alcohol? Is there any particular reason? And is there an age profile for those offenders given that those assaults are, the numbers are so high? That's my first question. Secondly, in your opening remarks, you talked about that you've got, had the best training and best <coughs> equipment in terms of your officers. Obviously, there's a public interest in relation to tasers um, today. And I'm looking back on a report that said in 2020, the HMICFRS said in September 20, um, there was reference made about the tasers, and there was a section in it so where they said they recommend the Chief Constable consult widely on proposed changes and communicate to the public safety benefits of such an approach before any changes are made. In relation to that report in September 2020, have you consulted or has there been any work done in relation to the tasers? And I would like to put on record that if you take that direction forward, uh, certainly, myself and our party would support the use of tasers being routinely given to all officers. Thanks, Trevor. And there's obviously a few bits packaged there. And obviously, um, yes, I did put the information in the public domain at the start of the week because it, it, it seemed to me to be unusually high. And there were a, a variety of nasty injuries and experiences, in, including blood being spat in somebody's mouth. So you imagine if that was you uh, or someone that you cared about. And absolutely, the first priority is to make sure that the office is effective, are supported. We have a nine-point plan that gives a routine framework, what we'd expect good looks like. Uh, and I echo your comments about wishing a speedy recovery. Indeed, hopefully this evening I'll be able to see the officer that was attacked yesterday and particularly seriously injured. So we, we, we're in that space to start with. Um, the pattern and the ages are, are quite interesting. So given the discussions we've had today, um, six of the 43 officers that were injured were actually involved in incidents involving people uh, in relation to being under 17. Um, so that again presents its own series of challenges about the proportionate use of our powers to deal with those issues. Um, but again, there's some of this remits to the work that Chris does in relation to monitoring how we use powers and the environment in which we do. Um, so rather than sort of go into too, too much broad brush today, we can probably give you a specific breakdown of the sort of patterns, age groups and underlying causes. It suffice to say, and this is where it gets really difficult, uh, given some of the range of questions today, that often a common theme in the encounters that officers have to face 
is different manifestations of what we would see as vulnerability. So people suffering from uh, mental health issues, uh, drug misuse, alcohol are often a consistent feature in the issues that both happen on the street where officers have to react quickly to what's presented to them and equally sometimes it's easy to overlook there's also incidents of violence even within custody centres so I think there's, there's a lot there. We did reflect on the specific you ask in relation to the previous report nearly three years ago now from HMIC and I think we've come back previously to sort of give our commitment to increase the availability to specialist armed officers of the I think it's a conducted energy device is actually the, the correct term and also to some of the officers that work in the close protection environment. Given the comments today from the Chair of the Federation and the concern that he has officers and indeed his indictment against the board which I would like to disassociate myself with because I've always supported um, that the officers are properly equipped. Given today that there is such a disgust in relation from the Federation and indeed the rank and file officers Will you move more swiftly now to make a decision to make them more routinely available for the officers for their use for a less lethal option? Yeah, again, I'll, 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 I'll be speaking to the Chair of the Federation later on this afternoon after this meeting because we, we, we speak and meet regularly in relation to this. And obviously, we have a Federation colleague in the room today because it's an important issue in terms of the welfare protection and our responsibilities in relation to health and safety of the staff that work for us. But, in a sense, we've already made a decision to increase availability so that it will be the armed response unit officers that will have more access. So we've, we've committed to, to uplift them and also because of some of the work we've been doing in relation to College of Policing standards and requirements, similarly to issue them once trained to close protection unit officers. So the, the availability will increase. Um, I think it's worth balancing as well, though, that these are often very quick incidents. Um, and, and we've got to also understand, which is maybe best in a committee meeting to, to, to brief members on what appropriate tactics are in different situations or indeed to come and see the equipment itself and the training we're doing so we get a clear appreciation of sort of almost like one size doesn't fit all and how we do these things. Because I know Mark particularly has looked at this in terms of, for example, the tactics that an armed response team will use when they turn up. So sometimes there's an impression that everyone will have a taser drawn. It's not necessarily so in terms of the specific training that they get. So that there is a lot at issue here, plus balancing confidence of the public that when we use different equipment, we're doing so, as Mark said earlier, proportionately to, to meet the threat that officers are faced with. But I have to balance supporting the officers that do a tremendous job every day in often very difficult circumstances where they have to make swift decisions that are often heavily scrutinized with also the public confidence of uh, the members of the public that we police. So we keep this under careful review. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Mark. Well, just to be clear, following the HMIC recommendation, we did look at it and we decided that we didn't want to do a full rollout at that time. But what we would do is increase the number of armed response officers who operate with these weapons inside a, a firearms controlled environment, they are under a command and control structure as opposed to the routine carriage of this type of weapon. So at that point, we decided not to do it, um, following the HMIC instruction. So they are carried by firearms teams, but not routinely carried. And that's the current position. And the chief says he wants to keep it under current review. Okay, thank you. And um, before we go to our very, very last question from Peter, quickly, Mike, you wanted to just quick comment? Yeah, in, in terms of a more widespread rollout, Simon, is finance a factor? I, I don't think it is in the short term. Obviously, if we ever got there, affordability, because um, you know, to equip every frontline officer in the hypothetical sense, that there is a procurement cost. There's a significant training cost uh, because, again, like many things, it's a he heavily regulated environment. So you'd be training carriage of a uh, person protective weapon alongside the or normal sort of uh, safety training, I think, which Mark was only doing the other day, and then there'd be a separate strand for this, so that it's it's not just a, a, a snap decision. We've got to look at a whole range of issues. But at the moment, I think it's fair to say we've increased availability, which is a confidence issue to the officers that have to face difficult situations. And again, we can probably provide information out of here to relevant committee about the number of occasions which tasers have been either drawn or used to deal with people in those situations where. Clearly, the public outcry will probably be even worse if we resorted to drawing a firearm 
and harming or injuring somebody in that sense. Thank you. Quickly, Jerry. Well, very quickly, since a number of people have uh, spoken on this, um, let me caution you against rushing anything, and especially with the tasers. Uh, we don't want to end up in an argument where then every police officer has a, a plastic bullet gun as well. Uh, there's special training on all these things, and giving it out to all officers is not necessarily in their interest as well as anybody else's. So I'm just making that point. I know it's coming through the committee and we'll discuss it right. But because it was made public, I, I, I'll just give you that point. Okay, thank you. And our last question to Peter. Thanks, Chair, uh, Chief Constable and team. Um, I, I want to ask a question in the context of changing demographics in this place and the variable, variable outcome rates in terms of hate crime, including in comparison with other crime as well. I think it's very welcome that PS and I, I believe have commissioned an external review of processes around hate crime and I think you've got that report. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any early lessons uh, learned so far and will the board or the public get a copy of that report at some point? Thanks Peter, you're obviously well briefed. <laughs> um, it's an important issue but work that Mark has um, done an awful lot of uh, effort on both nationally and locally. We did receive the report last week at our performance board uh, from the um, from one of Mark's colleagues that came to present it to us. Uh, there was some really encouraging news in there, actually, which obviously we want to share rather than the full board report or relevant committees. We just literally received it last week, but I think Mark will be happy to talk to some of the headlines. Sure. So um, the first thing to say is that nationally and locally, I come for hate crime are all running lower than I comes for other crimes. So that's a that's a pattern across across uh, uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, there are various reasons for that. Uh, we know that empirically that victims of hate crime um, have even less confidence in the justice system proportionately than than those who are not victims of hate crime but who are victims of other crime. Um, we also know that the, empirically that some of the impacts upon hate crime victims sometimes can be greater as well. Uh, we also know that there's there has there's been consistent inconsistency around police services, including our own, in identifying, calling it out, and then investigating this hate crime. So that's been a journey over the last number of years to try and improve it. And also in other parts of GB, the numbers of referrals to the CPS have also declined. So we have seen a decline in the last half a dozen years of uh, refer of um, investigatory outcomes. So um, and that has been challenged not just in this forum as you've done, but also in various fora around the UK. We asked the NPCC hate crime lead, who's me, <laughs> to get the team who I use in England to do an audit, to come over here and do an audit. Um, and um, uh, they were pleasantly surprised that this is a group of people who uh, are not police. Um, you know, they're community representatives. Various, but they're pleasantly surprised at the quality of the work that's going on here. That's not to say that they're saying that, you know, that uh, it's it's good enough because uh, it isn't, um, but they're surprised um, that that this that with the level of service that, that they're seeing here, um, there are lessons to be learned from it. Um, there are particular issues around still not recording all offences correctly, um, identifying the offences correctly. I think we were doing well in victim follow up, um, but not just well in, in sometimes identifying the offences. So I have no difficulty in preparing, providing the outcomes for that report. I've also in difficulty, you know, if the board wants to, in getting an independent briefing on how we're doing, separate from myself, um, uh, on the issue. Um, and uh, I say there's, uh, I'm very, very open to assisting the board to understand this further. Thank you. Chief Constable, thanks to you and your team for taking questions and to all those joining us here and online. Um, our next meeting is on the Thursday, the 2nd of March. Uh, at 11am. Uh, that concludes today's session. Thank you.